Well, yesterday I just finished a really good book uh, about one of my favorite subjects. It's called The Great Mortality, and it's about the Black Death. Uh, that's been a subject that's interested me for the longest possible time. It's the greatest catastrophe in human history when um, a bacillus, Y. pestis by name, swept out of Asia from underground marmoset communities where it's basically lived forever, moved into the human population, and then swept through Asia and into Europe and killed probably one-third, certainly a third of Europe and maybe up to a half, some places more than a half. It, as I said, the greatest catastrophe in human history. Some places didn't recover their pre-plague population for five or six hundred years after that. It's been a subject that always interested me. And watching them try to fight the plague, the first bout of the plague in the 1300s, late 1300s, it's, it's both sad and, and strangely encouraging and horrifying and somehow ennobling to watch them try to fight something that they didn't understand, that they simply couldn't understand. Uh, the idea of quarantine didn't come in until a little bit later, but, but certainly people knew that if there were sick people on a ship, you need to send that ship back to sea. And parenthetically, by the way, this entire greatest catastrophe in the world may have been caused by seven or eight ships uh, that basically sailing out of Kaffa uh, in the Black Sea knew they were dying and just wanted to sell their goods before, you know, before they went bankrupt. But put that aside for a second. These medieval people were trying to fight something. They knew that it spread. They knew that it spread by contact with other people. They thought maybe it was caused by bad air. They had stories of people walking around with herbs in their mouth and the famous plague doctors. But one of the theories was that if you have really, really bad air, that might chase out the less bad air. So during the Black Plague, you might find a crowd of people leaning over latrines with hoods over their heads, trying to inhale as much of this horrific, noxious fume as possible to, to, to prevent the plague. If you had a southern exposure window, that was bad for the plague. Northern window exposures were better because northern air was cooler and less deadly and all the rest of the things that they tried to figure out. But watching this tragedy in history unfold, I realized they simply didn't have the fundamental basic research to be able to stop that plague. We know that the bacillus travels from, from rodents to fleas, fleas bite humans, and we know, we know how to do it. As a matter of fact, uh, a young girl came down with plague in the United States just a short time ago, and nobody knew what it was until one doctor finally had the sense to realize, hey, these symptoms seem familiar to me. Once they realized it was bubonic plague, they got her on antibiotics, and she's doing just fine. So what does all this have to do with anything? Well, believe it or not, it's not about COVID. It's about deeper issues than that. We are suffering a, a, a catastrophic moral plague in America. And we, I, all of us, try to look at the symptoms and we try to figure out a way to understand what's going on and how can we stop it? How can we reverse it? How can we back it up? And it struck me on the way into work today. I was going to talk about um, vaccination, uh, vaccine passports today. But as I was coming in, I thought, you know, we're trying to solve a problem of cultural decay and, and moral decay and, and the unraveling of the fabric of society. We're trying to solve that problem. In the same way that the people in the, in the uh, 14th century were trying to solve the problems of the Black Death. We're, we're whacking at it and we're doing whatever seems obvious, but we don't have the fundamental research. We don't have the basic research to really understand what's going on. I don't have any answers here, but I realized after studying the Black Death that before you could come up with any answers, you had to, you had to know which questions to ask. So as a mutual thought experiment between all of us here today, Let's do some basic research into, into what's gone wrong with our society. And I thought we might start with the, um, with the mystery of the murals. When I started working at the Miami Planetarium in 1974, the Miami Planetarium is a dome structure and it's dark inside. And so when you would prepare to bring in a new show, we had a little walkway that went around the outside of the inner dome and inside the outer dome was a little curved walkway and we called that the ambulatory. And that's where the incoming audience would wait while we chucked the old audience out the door and, and got the thing reset for the next show. And in the ambulatory at the Space Transit Planetarium, 
there were a series of murals that were placed along the inside of this curved wall. I would say nine or 10 of them, something like this. And they were gigantic. They were taller than I am. They were enormous, huge, huge paintings, hand done specifically for the museum. And they were done in, um, in black light paint so that you could have a dark area so that people's eyes could get adjust adjusted for the planetarium show to come. But it was done with black light paint, so there were these murals of here's Galileo, and here's Copernicus, and here's the Jodrell Bank radio telescope. All of these astronomical murals lit by black light, kind of glowing in the dark, talking about the history of astronomy from the very beginning to right up to the Apollo missions. And they were gorgeous. They were absolutely fantastic. And those murals had been there since 1966. And I worked there from 73 until I went to college in 79, and, and everything was fine. And then I came back in the mid to late 80s, and I noticed that, that some of the murals had been, you know, people had written their names or their initials on them and, and maybe scratched a little part out. And I came back a few years later, and some people had added some sort of obscene little things to some of these things and added more of their names and scratched away more of the stuff. When it came back the time after that, these beautiful murals that were so magical had been covered with white, uh, with clear plexiglass, just plexiglass hanging in front of them. And then I came back a couple years later, and the plexiglass had been marked up with uh, markers, and people scratched their names into the plexiglass. And so finally, they ended up putting particle board over the whole thing, just horrible, nasty particle board. And it was heartbreaking. And what was even more heartbreaking was when I went and visited the place for the final time, as I was pulling into this parking lot that I'd been in on and off for 20 years, I looked off behind the dome there on the, in the sort of in the back area. And I saw this stack and I walked over there and piled up outside in the rain and the humidity uh, of Miami was a pile of these murals. Just all of them stacked one on top of each other. They're all warped by rain and mildew eating them away and stuff. But I thought, my God, if I'd known they were going to take them down, I would have found the money to put them in storage because they were that beautiful. So if we're going to talk about basic research, about what's gone wrong in society, I think this would be a pretty good place to start. Why is it that for certainly 10 years and probably closer to 20, you could have murals within easy fingertip range. I mean, they're right there. Hand-painted, really, really beautiful pieces of art. And for 10 or 12 or 15 years, not a mark on them. And then suddenly, there were marks on them. And then the more marks that got on them, the more marks that there were going to be on them. And then you make an effort to cover them and protect them, and then people deface the protection, till finally you just simply covered them up, and then when all was said and done, you just threw these priceless things away, these murals. What changed? What happened? I don't exactly have the answer to that, needless to say, but something happened. Something happened. I was talking with my wife about this, and I just said, what, what changed? What, what has happened? And she had a really interesting insight. She said, well, you wouldn't deface those murals today. I said, no, of course not. And the people who went there in the 60s and 70s wouldn't deface those murals today, would they? No, you're right. It's not that people have changed. It's that the composition of the population has changed. Something has changed in terms of, of, of what young people are doing. When I say young people, I'm talking about people who are in their 40s and 50s now. Something changed, and what used to be not only uh, abnormal, but just inconceivable, that somebody would mark or write on something this beautiful, it was done, you know, tremendous amount of effort. The idea that somebody would deface that was just, it was just inconceivable, and suddenly it wasn't. What happened? I don't know, but sometimes when you're doing this kind of basic research, you find things that may not seem connected, but then suddenly they are. Uh, a man was um, culturing bacteria, and uh, he found out that um, when he came back after a few days, some bread mold had gotten into one of his cultures. And the bread mold had spread, 
And he realized that there was something in this mold that was killing these bacteria. It was an antibiotic. And that's where penicillin came from. And penicillin is the end of the plague. Now, if you told the people in the Middle Ages that the answer to your problem is moldy bread, I don't think they would have known what to do with it. But nevertheless, those two things are connected. And we know how they're connected now through the benefit of hindsight. And I'm trying to find where the connection is between all of these things that I'm seeing. And again, coincidentally, as I was coming in today, I have on my um, iPhone, I, I don't know, two, three hundred songs. It's a pretty eclectic mix. A lot of stuff from, from uh, the old days and so on. And I was listening to a song on the way in and I realized, I wonder if this is something like the bread mold in the Petri dish. So I've got my music library on shuffle, and as I'm coming in, all of a sudden, here comes uh, Steve Miller Band. Hooray, great song I remember from well, when I was a senior in high school. Take the money and run, and I'm listening to it like I always did. And then suddenly I listened to it like I didn't always do. Let me just read you some of the lyrics here real quick. Uh, this is a story about Billy Joe and Bobby Sue, two young lovers with nothing better to do. Sit around the house, get high, and watch the tube. And here's what happened when they decided to cut loose. Now, I've heard these next lyrics a hundred times. They headed down to oh, old El Paso. That's where they ran into a great big hassle. Billy Joe shot a man while robbing his castle. Bobby Sue took the money and run. Ooh, 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 go on, take the money and run. I love that song. I still love that song. But when I listened to it today, it occurred to me that this is the story about two teen... I mean, it's not that I didn't know this, it's just that I didn't hear it. This is a story about two teenage murderers who go down to El Paso, and, and they didn't commit murder. They got themselves into a great big hassle. Shot a man while robbing his castle. That'd be his home. Then they took the money and run. Woo-hoo. Billy Max, a detective down in Texas, you know, makes his living on other people's taxes. He's the big fat bad guy. And guess what? In the end, happy days. Oh, they slipped away. They got off to Mexico, and they're still wanted today. They got away. Do these two things have anything to do with each other? I got to think that on some level they probably do. Politics is downstream of culture, but, but culture is downstream of people. People make culture. And I realized that I had ingested that song. And, it's, and I love the song, and I still love the song, and I'm not one of these guys calling for the end of rock and roll, but I am saying that something changed. And... Certainly, the idea of a song that glorified two teenagers going down to Texas, murdering a man in his house, taking the money and running down to Mexico, evading the law, that would not have been something that a healthy society would have written about. The whole mid to late 70s, even in the early 70s, was the beginning of the kind of the countercultural revolution. And we stopped seeing heroes. And we started seeing things like Easy Rider and... Um, you know, uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde, a great example. There you've got the handsomest man in the world, and Faye Dunaway, and it's about a couple of people that basically ran through the Midwest and murdered at will. But now they're glamorous, and now the lawmen that are coming after them, they're the bad guys, and something happened. And somehow, over time, we became so used to this message of the anti-hero, this message of, of, of the criminal as the hero, the message that, that the law enforcement is always the bad guys, they're the big, fat, you know, uh, tobacco-chewing racists. And, and, and we got into this entire cycle where now everybody assumes that everybody's corrupt. We learn everything we learn from things like movies and television. I was on a jury four or five years ago. It's undoubtedly much worse now. Pretty simple thing, really. It was a, a, a case involving a woman who assaulted a police officer while the police officer was trying to arrest her boyfriend. And I happened to be the foreman on that jury, and as we went into deliberations, we talked about the testimony that we'd heard, and 
seven of the 12 people said, yeah, but that's not true. That can't be true. What, what are you talking about? Well, the police, is, the police are lying. What, what are they lying about? Well, they, they're always lying. You know? and, and I realized what was happening was not so much just distrust in the police. What was happening was that entire jury was prepared for the twist. Where's the twist? They'd seen crime dramas their entire lives, police dramas their entire lives. All they ever saw about trials and juries was some kind of twist. This guy, we thought did it, but turns out he didn't. Turns out this guy did it. All of this together, I know it sounds like I'm floundering here, and the reason it sounds like I'm floundering is because I'm floundering, but I am trying to put together on some level the basic research to understand what's happening to this society so that we can at least have some chance of figuring out a way to stop this infection and, and get it under control. And all of these things are related, and I don't know how they're related, and I know so much of these things sound ridiculous, but another thought that occurred to me was that when I was, when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old, I played Little League Baseball. And several years ago, I had a chance to go to a bunch of soccer games, youth soccer games with a friend of mine who had a 10-year-old son, and I watched a lot of youth soccer. And this got nothing really to do so much with, with, with soccer, but I realized, you know, in baseball, in baseball, there's a moment, this is not a news flash, th there's a moment where where each person is on a team on one when when you're playing defense everybody's on a team team has to work together you have a specific assignment you're in right field if a ball comes to right field and you drop it it's your fault everybody has to work together everybody has to work like a well-oiled machine that ball has to go back and forth between the bases and then of course in baseball there comes a time when you stand there by yourself and there's no way to to, to spread that responsibility around. You're either going to get a hit or you're going to strike out or whatever the case may be. And when I watch youth soccer, I realize it's just a bunch of kids running around kicking the ball. And none of that, none of that responsibility, individual responsibility is there, and none of that individual um, spotlight is there. And if somebody had said to you, well, the reason that we're talking about COVID-19 passports and the loss of our freedom is because we stopped playing Little League Baseball and started playing soccer. I'm not making that case, but I am saying that something like this is what changed, and it changed all across the board. And I think it's time we started asking ourselves these, these basic research questions. Not just the, well, what do we do about, uh, about this uh, fact that there is no law anymore? What do we do about election integrity? These things are important issues. But again, to me, that sounds like chasing the plague down and, and, and depending on vapors or, or herbs or, or, or flagellation or something to stop the spread of a bacteria that's transmitted from fleas through, uh, through rodents. We have got to understand the fundamentals of what's happening to this society. What is the sickness and what is the transmission vector? How is this societal plague of, of, of just careening to disaster? What's causing it? Not how can we stop it. We don't know how to stop it. If we knew how to stop it, we would stop it. We're all of us watching this every day getting more and more and more insane. Fonts are racist now. Pete Buttigieg, Pete Buttigieg said, or whatever his name is, you know who I'm talking about, that um, infrastructure is racist. Everything's racist. If everything's racist, then nothing is racist. What's going on? What's going on? I don't know. But I do know that because I don't know, that means that there's a gap in our fundamental knowledge of the dynamic. We don't have the basic research answers necessary to stop this plague. And we won't have the ability to stop this plague until we start asking these basic research questions and stop for a moment, not forever, still do what we can do with our limited knowledge, but, but, but instead of constantly trying to, 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 to figure out how to undo this latest catastrophe, we need, to be, we need to be doing the fundamental lab research to figure out what has happened to this society what is the fundamental change in society that meant that for 15 years, these beautiful pieces of artwork could be completely unprotected and not a mark on them, and then suddenly not? 
and then suddenly not, then suddenly more and more and more and, and escalating degrees of defacement, graffiti, all of it. I'm not here with any answers on this subject. I don't have, I don't have, I was going to say I don't have a clue, but I have a few clues. If we can find the cause and find the causal links that created this selfishness and disrespect, and that's the fundamental word, by the way, is disrespect. Disrespect. When, before this plague struck, anybody, we had all, the Miami Planetarium didn't cost $10,000 a seat for admission. This was a general admission facility. This was people from all walks of life, of all different economic um, uh, levels. School kids would come in, bust in from all over Dade County all the time. And it didn't happen, and then it did. This is the mystery of the murals. What happened? I think the clearest symptom is that somehow people lost respect. They lost respect for the artist who put the work into it. They lost respect for the fact that somebody coming would see something less than what they had seen because they'd gone and marked it up. They, there's a, a selfishness that accompanies all graffiti, the idea of I've got to spray my initials on something so people know I'm here. This is undoubtedly related to the collapse of the family and, and lack of father figures, and it's all tied together. But for the final time on this episode, this reading of the, of the history of the Black Death tells me that chasing symptoms is going to have, at most, a negligible effect, and in some cases may make the situation worse. Why is it? that our leaders want us to have vaccine passports. Well, they want us to have vaccine passports because they want to be able to limit our ability to travel based on some external condition. And not just our political leadership, but the people who run Google and Facebook. And why are they so fascinated and intrigued and, and possessed by this idea of control? What is it about their contempt for regular people, their disrespect for citizens that makes them think that they not only have a right but an obligation to tell us where to go, what to do. What kind of arrogance is that? What kind of disrespect? What kind of what kind of, of ignorance really drives this kind of thing? So I'll be looking forward very much to your comments on this. And um, with any luck, we'll be able to put enough little pieces on the table that we can start to draw some connections and from some connections perhaps we cannot find the answers we're looking for, but at the very least, we can start to begin to understand the questions that we need to ask.